Hello, I'm Dr. Stan Campiano from the Department of Medicine at Mayo Clinic, Florida. I will summarize the content of our paper titled Rare Incidence of Ventricular Tachycardia and Torsade de Poin in Hospitalized Patients with Prolonged UTC who later received levofloxacin. But first, I would like to thank the Mayo Clinic Proceedings for reviewing our work and making it public. This article will appear in an upcoming issue of the Proceedings. Ventricular tachycardia and torsade have been reported in patients treated with levofloxacin as well as other fluoroquinolones. Although the likelihood of developing fluoroquinolone-induced ventricular tachycardia in an individual patient may be low, the problem is magnified by the widespread use of these antibiotics. Levofloxacin is considered unsafe in patients with prolonged QT, but the evidence is mostly limited to case reports. We completed a retrospective analysis of 1,004 patients with a QTC greater than 450 milliseconds who were hospitalized and subsequently received levofloxacin. The primary outcome was sustained ventricular tachycardia. We found only two patients with sustained VTAC. Both patients had severe cardiac disease and septic shock. The first patient had a baseline QTC of 509 milliseconds that went up to 590 during the hospitalization while receiving two other QT prolonging medications. The second patient with normal QTC at baseline was receiving amitriptyline and her longest QTC was only 477. Neither patient developed polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. In a separate analysis of 52 patients who received levofloxacin and subsequently died in the hospital, we found one case of torsad in an 83-year-old lady with a QTC of 528. She had no other identifiable risk factors and her death was not precipitated by arrhythmia. It is known that some patients with minimally prolonged QTC develop torsade while others with a much longer QTC never do. Our second patient's QTC was below 500, which some consider to be a cutoff for high risk. A prolonged QTC, although nonspecific, remains the most valuable predictor of torsade. Another important issue is the risk associated with drug-drug interactions. It's been reported that 10% of patients who fill a prescription for a QT prolonging medication already take at least one other QT prolonging drug. There are currently over 100 medications with QT prolonging effect on the U.S. market, so it's virtually impossible for the practicing clinician to memorize all names and interactions. Drug databases linked to our electronic medical records provide us with valuable information, but strongly worded messages, including VTAC and death, may lead to the use of a second or third line antibiotic, perhaps in a low risk person, particularly in the outpatient setting. Our study has limitations, starting with its retrospective design, which may have introduced a data collection bias. Torsad is usually self-limited, which may have led to events being missed, but the fact that the overwhelming majority of our patients were on telemetry units may have been a mitigating factor. Patients with left bundle branch block or electronic pacemakers who may have abnormal QT due to depolarization rather than repolarization abnormalities were not analyzed separately. The results of our study suggest that when fluoroquinolones are deemed the appropriate treatment choice in a patient with prolonged QT, they may be considered a reasonable option, especially in patients with life-threatening infections. Millions of prescriptions for QT prolonging medications are written every year, and there's growing concern in the medical community about the arrhythmogenic effect of antibiotics, not only levofloxacin, but also macrolides, such as azithromycin. Additional studies are needed to assess the arrhythmogenic risk related to antibiotics in both hospitalized and ambulatory patients. Ideally, we would like to have a quantitative assessment tool to more accurately define the risk associated with antibiotic therapy. Thank you very much for your time and your interest in our paper. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.